All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will be speaking. I'll dive right into it because I'm, I have only half an hour and I want to cover quite a bit of material on uh, primate uh, cognition. And, and I do want to mention that um, words like cognition and sentience and emotions and consciousness were not used for animals when I was a student. They could, could not be used. You could not say that animals have emotions at that time. And I want to go briefly over the objections to that kind of talk. Because animals were machines at the time. They were stimulus response machines. So the restrictions that we had is that we should focus on observable behavior. It's the only science for a while which, which insisted on that, because in other sciences we do a lot of unobservables, like the Big Bang has never been observed, evolution has never been observed. So, so but in behavioral science we had to work with observables. Um, it was either, uh, all behavior needed to fit in two boxes. It was either instinctive or it was conditioning, and, and there was really nothing else. Um, humans were, by definition, unique, and there's still, of course, many people who feel that way. And you should avoid anthropomorphism. And, and let me say something about anthropomorphism. I certainly have no problem with it, but, you know, I work with animals which are anthropomorph by themselves. Um, uh, so so I, that's fairly logical. But I think in our language we should respect homologies. Homologies are traits that are similar because there is a common descent. Uh, for example, the hand of a human and the hand of a chimpanzee are structurally extremely similar and functionally extremely similar, uh, and they derive from a common ancestor who had also hands, and so you have to respect that in your language. You cannot call it a front paw or something else, or, or you cannot call the face of a chimpanzee a snout. So you have to respect in your language the similarities, and so if you, for example, see a baby gorilla who's being tickled by its mom and is laughing, you have to call it laughing. When I was a student, we, we were asked to call it vocalized panting because people didn't like the similarity with laughing. Yeah, yeah now you're laughing or, or vocalized panting uh, right there. So I had to invent a new word, which is anthropodenial, which is the opposite of anthropomorphism, is when people a priori say that we are different and, and insist on different language. And actually, I would say in academia, except in fields like neuroscience and medicine and biology, but in the rest of academia, is full of anthropodenial. People deny the connection with animals, and they deny that we are animals. Now, it's funny that before the previous century, in the, in the 19th century, uh, Darwin could freely speak about emotions in animals. And it's the only book of Darwin that disappeared from view. Like for a whole century, it, it was out of print, and you couldn't get it because it was declared um, unscientific. But Darwin could speak about the emotions in animals, and then the hammer came down, and we couldn't do it anymore. Now, he focused on the face, and in all the emotion research, we focus on the face also in the primates. A uh, human face is very special, but the expressions are very similar. And um, it used to be thought that humans had, because we have so many nuanced emotions, that we had many more muscles in the face than any other animal. Uh, five years ago, there was a post-mortem study on chimpanzees and found exactly the same number of mimetic muscles in the face of the chimpanzee as in the human. And so a chimpanzee is capable of expressing the same range of emotions that we express. And I think they have the same range of emotions also. So here you have my co-worker Zanna Clay who has been playing with a bonobo and they have a very similar facial expression as you see. And here you have the laughing face of chimpanzees and gorillas. And so you can find laughing behavior very easily, and I'll show you a little video of this, and hopefully you can hear the sound of the laughing also. <laughs> mm. 
And so laughter, uh, chimpanzee, young chimpanzees, they have the same tickling spots as children under the armpits, in the belly. They have the same reaction, ambivalent reaction also that they, they laugh when you tickle them, but then they push your hands away, but then they wait for you to come back. And so you saw that a little bit in this video. It's, um, the reactions are very similar. Uh, and, and so all the expressions I think that you see in humans, you can see in chimpanzees. I personally think all the emotions that you see in humans, you can see in chimpanzees. And so often the chimpanzee and the bonobo, our two closest relatives, they have been used as a sort of wedge to get at the issue of animal cognition. Because we accept uh, certain cognitive traits in the chimpanzee much more easily than we accept them in a fish or in a rat. And so the chimpanzee has been at the forefront of breaking open the whole issue of animal cognition. But now we live in a time where we, um, we study animal cognition in all sorts of species. One thing I want to mention in the study of the emotions is that we have this whole discussion, and maybe you're not following that discussion, between emotion and feeling. And, and usually we define emotion as the physical reactions, the, the, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the physiology, the, 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 the neurology of the reactions and the facial expressions, of course, and the voice and so on. So that's the emotional expression. And then you have the feelings, which are mental representations and, and feelings we can only get from humans because humans talk about their feelings, even though I must say I don't trust what people say about their feelings. But um, in a way, I'm very happy to work with animals who cannot tell me what they feel. So, uh, but we have this whole discussion now in the field of emotions of um, whether we're uh, dealing with feelings or emotions. And, and I think a lot of the discussions by psychologists of emotions are discussions of feelings. That's what they test, that's what they ask people about. Uh, and, em and emotions are expressed in the body. Emotions are easy to measure. I don't see any problem talking about emotions in an objective way, but when people say you cannot know the emotions of a dog, what they mean is you cannot know the feelings of a dog, which is true. There's, there's one experiment that was done by Lisa Parr, a student of mine. Um, there's one experiment where we think we got something of the feelings of the chimpanzees. This was an experiment where we showed them, uh, this is on a computer screen, we showed them a video clip of a pleasant situation or an unpleasant situation. So the, the unpleasant situation is the veterinarian coming with a dart gun. And um, the pleasant situation is, is animal caretakers coming with food. So we showed them videos and then we let them choose the faces that go with the video. Uh, and they, they were not trained or instructed to do that. And they picked the happy face, which is the laughing face, with the happy situations, and the distressed face with the unhappy situations. And so we had an impression. In humans, we would certainly interpret that as that they understand the feelings associated with a certain situation. And uh, I think that's what we got in the chimpanzees. So I, I personally believe in the ripple rule, in the sense that um, Everything we discover, usually first in apes, ends up being discovered in many other species. Uh, I don't think there's a fundamental difference between the chimpanzee and other animals. Also, I don't think there's a fundamental difference between humans and chimpanzees. Uh, I think there's continuity everywhere. And so the ripple rule is really what we have seen in the last 20 years uh, in, in the study of cogn cognition in animals. So ripple effects. I think tool use is a typical example. We now have tool use studies in, in birds uh, and some other species. Uh, but it started, of course, first with the, the Köhler experiments uh, on chimpanzees. Uh, we have it in peacemaking studies. We have it in empathy studies. Mirror self-recognition is, is now also rippling to other species. And the sense of fairness, I do quite a few studies of those. I'm going to focus on, on two of those only. So we have, we have moved from the Köhler experiments, which were the first ones to break the rules of Skinnerian behaviorism. And that's why everyone in Skinner, especially, and all his followers were very upset with Köhler, because Köhler demonstrated that chimpanzees could think and could solve a problem without trial and error learning. And we have now the mind of the bee. And so we have, we have moved from. Uh, studies in mostly chimpanzees to all sorts of other species. And I'm going to focus on just two of these, on empathy 
and mirror self-recognition. So empathy, this is a dictionary definition of empathy. Uh, to understand and share the feelings of another and you see immediately the two components. You see the, the cognitive one and the emotional one. And you have basically two channels. You have an, uh, a body channel of empathy where you talk with a sad person, you will have a sad expression on your face. You talk with a happy person who's laughing, you will probably be laughing. That's the body channel that comes in very early in life. Uh, on day one, basically, of, of babies, babies cry when they hear other babies cry. Sometimes on an airplane, there's 10 babies who cry. So, so that's emotional contagion, and that's, that's uh, found in all the mammals, basically, and, and it starts very early in human life. Then the second one is more complex, is where you take the perspective of somebody else and try to understand the situation of somebody else, and that comes much later, and is much more complex. So we do studies on the body synchronization by looking at yawn contagion. So here you see a yawning gorilla. Actually, all the vertebrates yawn, fish yawn, birds yawn, elephants yawn. Everybody yawns, and we don't know exactly why. This is a chimp who's looking at a yawning ape. So yawn contagion has now also been studied in dogs. You can, can try it at home if you have an empathic dog. They will yawn when you yawn. So yawn contagion uh, is related to empathy. It's not exactly, it doesn't have much of an emotional content. But um, if you do these studies, this is on chimpanzees. This is their reaction to chimpanzees that they know and this to chimpanzees that they don't know. So they only have the yawn contagion for chimps that they know, that they live with. Uh, and that, that has also been found in human empathy studies. There are actually a study in Italy here was done uh, of yawn contagion in, in railway stations and waiting rooms. And people yawn when they stand next to somebody they know they who's yawning and not for a stranger. So that's the, the social bias of empathy that we find in all the studies, also now in rodent studies, are, are being found. We also do consolation behavior. This is um, a bonobo who has lost a fight in front and is being consoled. It's a traditional way of studying empathy in human children, and we see a lot of this behavior in the apes. Uh, that say they console a distressed individual. I'll show you two videos of it. This is a baby bonobo, three or four years old, who is, has been bitten by a female on the left and then screams, and you will see what happens. Ben, didn't you just uh, attack So you also see how immediately effective the contact is, and, and the screaming stops immediately. You will also see that in the next video. Let's see. You see, she just got bitten by the sala. Um, that okay? So these consolation responses, very typical of the apes. It's the way human children are studied also. So what psychologists do, they go into a human home, they ask an adult to cry, and they see how the children respond. Uh, the, and, and if you show consolation, they call it a, a reaction of empathy. Uh, girls doing it more than boys in, in many of these studies. And so there's a gender difference also in this regard that we also find in the primates. So we do these studies in a sanctuary. And, and all these bonobos, they are traumatized orphans. They, they, they are there because there's bushmeat hunting in Africa and uh, they are adopted and then brought into the sanctuary. And traumatized orphans in human studies, like the Romanian orphanages, they have trouble with empathy, and I think our bonobos have trouble with empathy. But we also have some moderate ones, as you see, who, who are born in the colony, and we can compare them with, with this. And if you look at um, consolation behavior, you see that the juveniles do more than the adults, twice as much, actually. 
that's not because the adults don't have empathy, but they become more selective, I think, in how they express it. But the, the biggest difference is these, these guys, these are the moderate ones, we only have juveniles, and they do far more of it. So it's very similar to the studies in, in the Romanian orphanages, is that the traumatized orphans who have lost their mother to poachers, um, they have trouble with empathy for others. Now recently, I was involved in a study with Larry Young, who's a specialist of oxytocin, on um, the neuroscience of empathy. We never do the neuroscience on elephants or chimpanzees and so on, but on the voles, the rodents, we could do it. And I'm not going to show you the experiment, I don't have time for that, but um, just to show you the outcome of it. First of all, we find the social bias, like we find in all the empathy studies, is that the prairie voles, they only console mates and siblings, they don't console other individuals. We find that there's emotional contagion. If you measure the corticoids in them, they match perfectly between the two individuals, the one who is stressed and the one who is not stressed in this particular experiment. And we find that if you block the oxytocin receptors, the behavior disappears. And so the conclusion of this study, and there's now several more on rodents, there's quite a bit of rodent studies on empathy. Uh, the conclusion of this was that uh, the, the neuroscience of empathy is very similar across the board in, in humans and other species. Now the second topic I want to mention is mere self-recognition. Let me first show you how that looks. This is a chimpanzee who has a hole in her head. Uh, caused by a male. So she has been injured and she's using our cell phone as a mirror to inspect the injury on her head. So this is very deliberate and spontaneous behavior. That's probably the male who did it actually in the back. So it's, it's very spontaneous behavior. You, you don't need to do a lot of experiments to find that chimpanzees have this reaction to mirrors. I see it all the time when I have my sunglasses on. My chimps use my sunglasses to look at themselves and they're behind and inside their mouths and stuff like that. So this is a monkey. Monkey is different, a capuchin monkey. The monkey doesn't have that reaction. The monkey is interested in the mirror and I don't think he sees the mirror as a stranger but it doesn't have a self-connection with the mirror. And, and so we are all apes, of course. We are large primates without tails. That makes you all apes. So, so apes and monkeys, there's, there's quite a dividing line. And for the, for the longest time, that was the big dividing line in mirror self-recognition studies. And people made a big deal out of it. Now then other species got tested at some point. This is a test of the elephant. And um, they found no evidence for mere self-recognition in the elephant, even though the elephant has a brain three times bigger than our brain, but they didn't do it. And uh, this was the experimental setup, and you see the elephant, what the elephant sees is just a few legs moving around, I guess, and, and twice the bars, and I, I'm not sure that this was a good experiment, but they, they found no evidence for elephant mere self-recognition. We did a, a better study, we, this is me on Pepsi the elephant in Thailand with Josh Plotnik. We started testing elephants in the Bronx Zoo in New York and then in Thailand. And here Josh is applying paint to one side of the head of the elephant. And on the other side he puts a sham mark. He puts a mark, it's the same paint but without the color in it so you cannot see it. He puts it on the other side of the head of Pepsi. And then Pepsi is put in front of a big mirror. So much bigger than in the other year experiment, and, and, and he's marked on the left sa side now, and you will see what he does. So he makes a connection between his mirror image and the mark on his head. And, and he's now marked on the right-hand side, it's a different day. Yeah, it's a non-toxic paint. <laughs> and, 
And so on the other side of the head, he has been marked, but you cannot see the mark. And now he, look what he does. He looks inside his mouth, which, which is also something that the apes always do, because inside your mouth is a place that you feel the whole day, but you never get to see. And so many animals are curious about that. And so the elephant passed the mark test. I must say, not all elephants do, some do. Uh, and, and so it is important to know that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, which is a rule that we really should keep in mind also with many of the ape studies where certain things have not been found. I think that's an important rule to keep in mind. Now, after the studies on elephants and dolphins and magpies and then the apes and the failures in monkeys with the mirror test, all of a sudden, fish came along. It's very interesting. And this is the cleaner fish. has been studied extensively. It's a, a small but very smart uh, little fish, which has a very complex life, cleaning the exterior of uh, bigger fish. And the bigger fish are potentially dangerous because they can eat the cleaner fish. And so the, the cleaner fish has been tested now extensively on mirrors. And I think the outcome is truly remarkable and illustrates the, the ripple rule that I mentioned, is that we, we move from the, the apes to other large-brained mammals, and now we are uh, interested in fish studies. So this, this is the reaction to the mirror by these fish, just, just the reaction of being exposed to the mirror. And you see this is their aggression level to strangers, to neighbors, and to themselves in the mirror. That's very different from the, the typical songbird. You know how songbirds keep going at the mirror and keep being aggressive and they never stop really. Uh, this fish is very different. This fish doesn't confuse, it seems, self in the mirror with a stranger. And then they were tested. You mark the fish, you put them in front of the mirror. They can, of course, they don't have hands to clean themselves uh, or trunks like the elephant. And what they do is they see themselves in the mirror and then they go to a substrate, like a rock, and they clean, clean themselves off. And then they go back to the mirror to see what has happened to them. So um, this is the way the, the, the fish have been tested. And what has been found is that if you give them an ecologically valid marker, which is a brown marker, because that's the parasites. The parasites that they have are brown, are not blue or red or something. And so they only react to the brown markers and they clean themselves uh, if there's a mirror and not when there's no mirror. So those were the first studies on these fish and they were truly remarkable. But I think the last ones are really uh, something else. The last ones have indicated that these fish, they recognize each other by face. Not the whole body, but by the, the, the face. And um, mirror exposure allows fish to recognize their own face from a lineup. So you show them multiple faces, and a fish who has been exposed to the mirror can pick out its own face. A fish who has not seen the mirror itself in the mirror cannot do that. Uh, and when presented with self photographs with a marker on the throat, mirror experienced fish scrape their, scrape their throat. And so the fish can use the mirror to get to know their face. They can use that information to uh, pick out their face from a lineup. And they can use that information if they see a mark on their face to start to clean themselves. If, you, if they see a mark on another face, they don't do that. So this is really remarkable. And this is um, more than we even have for the apes. And, and I have the impression that in the fish, the mirror self-recognition is different than in the apes. In apes and humans, it is probably based on self-contingency. I see my hand moving if I move my hand in the mirror. So self-contingency of movement. Uh, whereas in the fish, it seems to be more based on identity. So it's maybe a different mechanism the way they recognize themselves. But at least it's uh, the same principle. And now, as a result, I'm sort of trying to um, modify the, the rules. The rules used to be in the literature of mirror self-recognition that mirror self-recognition is binary. You either have it or you don't. And it was called self-awareness. You either, as an animal, you're self-aware or you're not self-aware. And the self-aware animals were humans and apes, hominids. And, and, and some people have added uh, the elephants, the dolphins, and, and uh, other species. 
Um, but um, there's, there's even some people who don't accept these other species. They only accept hominids uh, as having self-awareness. And so this was a sort of binary um, approach. And I think it's more like this. Is you have all sorts of gradations of uh, mere self-recognition. And I probably need to modify it. This is already an older picture. I now need to modify it probably. And it's never zero. There are no animals without self-awareness. I think every animal needs to know its own body and its own capacities and its own place in the world, especially if it's a social animal, needs to know that. And so I think um, um, this idea that there, is, there are animals who are self-aware and animals who are not self-aware, I think is nonsense. I think all animals have some degree of self-awareness and we now need to include a lot of different species in this. So, so one thing we're doing at the moment in this field is trying to develop different tests than the mirror test. Because the mirror test is very visual. So why would it work for a dog, for example, or a rat? It's a very visual test and it's very limiting, I think. And so we have now different tests to see how aware are animals of their own bodies. So this is a test that was recently done uh, in Thailand with the elephants. Let me see if I can play this. It's, it's based on a human test. So the elephant is... I'm going to explain what happens here. Let me first show this. The elephant steps on a platform and needs to give this stick to the human to get food, but cannot give this stick if it stays on the platform. So the elephant has to realize that its own body is blocking it from giving the stick to the human and step out of the way, and that's what the elephant does. This has also, be, also been done with children. So, so these are sort of alternative tests that people are now developing. There are several others. There's also olfactory tests to see if we can get at self-awareness in a different way um, than with the mirror test. And the last thing I want to show you <laughs> I was just recently in Colombia to see monkeys. Uh, these are capuchin monkeys. And they were crossing the road. And I'm just going to show you the situation of, uh, from the monkey's perspective. Is, uh, the monkey is going to climb up. As you see, it's, it's a very big distance they need to jump. He's going to climb up to a high point and then make an enormous jump. There we go. <laughs> And you will see a second one doing it. It was 25 monkeys crossing the road. So the monkeys need to know exactly what they can do with their body, how far they can jump, how heavy they are. Sometimes you have females who have a juvenile on their back, which means that they need to recalculate the whole thing. And so you need to, to act in the world. You need to have some level of self-awareness of your capacities and, and how, how your body impacts the tree on the other side and so on. And so I think self-awareness maybe not the, the highest level, but self-awareness is required for every animal uh, who lives in a physical environment, which is every animal, and, and especially also animals who live in a social environment. And I thank you for your attention.